I think it's important you know what happened uh, this weekend because uh, as a part of this church, even though you weren't there, uh, because you support me as your pastor and, and things I do, you're a part of that. Right? I'm just the tip of the spear. And so I want you all to know what kind of ministry you all participated in uh, this past weekend. Um, on, on Friday, uh, I, my wife and I went to, uh, and Derek, uh, went to Lampasas, Texas, uh, to do a funeral service for David Brown. Uh, David joined our church, I think, uh, in 2008. Uh, David was actually a friend of mine. Uh, David and I grew up in the same youth group. There were a whole bunch of us in our youth group that all accepted God's call to ministry, and so we were all a bunch of preacher boys. And we grew up under the same youth minister and learned the same things. There's a whole lot of us. And David was one of those and a, and a good friend. Um, and when he, when he joined our church and in 2008, he had, was in the process of being diagnosed with a terrible disease uh, that I had never heard of uh, called Huntington's disease. Um, the symptoms of Huntington's it's a, it's a fatal disease. There is no cure. Um, the symptoms of Huntington's has been described as a combination between um, Parkinson's disease, uh, ALS, and Alzheimer's all combined. And so when you're diagnosed with this, it is... Um, it is not just a death sentence, but it is, it is a slow one. And um, it's also a genetic disorder. Uh, if, if a parent of yours had it, has it, that means there's a 50-50 chance that you will have. And there, like I said, there is no cure. And so uh, David came and joined our church. And his whole family came, and, and uh, he had a son. And his, he was unable to drive, and so his grandparents would, or David's parents would bring uh, their grandson, David's son, to our church. And that's when he saw his son each week, um, was at our church. Uh, David was a part of a Sunday school class upstairs, and at the time, Mike Lonegro was a teacher. Uh, occasionally, when, um, when Mike was out of town, David substituted for him. Uh, he asked me a favor. He asked me if uh, he could preach a final sermon. And so on uh, December 28th, I think, 2009, uh, he, on a Sunday night, uh, he preached to just a few people uh, right here, his, his last sermon. Um, he has been in a nursing home in New Braunfels uh, for the past, well, most of that time, but at least for the last five years. He's been in several different ones. Uh, it's hard to watch someone your age you know, descend into that kind of a disease. Uh, I remember sitting with David, and we're in a nursing home, and so most of the people obviously are older than him, um, and he was barely able to function uh, sitting with the older people at the table playing dominoes, you know, and, and not really having the physical ability to, to move the dom or no, it was bingo, I'm sorry, it was bingo that he was playing, and not really having the physical ability to move the chips around, and so I helped him with that. So it was a hard thing to watch. Um, what I want to share with you about David is uh, God used that, because I knew David for a long time, and uh, he loved God the most in the middle of that disease and, and told me so. Um, God really used that in his life to bring David closer to himself. And so uh, we had many conversations about the Lord, and uh, it got harder and harder for him to speak. Uh, but until I couldn't understand him anymore and still well past that, he was still talking to me about Jesus. And so we did that funeral on on Friday, and um, Derek learned some Rich Mullins songs for us, which I appreciate him doing very much, um, because Rich Mullins was his favorite, uh, his favorite singer. And so uh, we did that service uh, for David, and honestly, um, the pain is because of the suffering, not because uh, he's finally been promoted. That part of it was a celebration. And so to be able to talk about and to know uh, the David is finally free was awesome, right? And so I share part of that story with you to say that, that you supported Derek and I in, in being able to go and minister to the family in that way. I also want to thank those of you who have visited David and for those of you who have been praying for David faithfully for 10 years. Uh, you can stop praying for David now. He's doing quite well. Um, <laughs> I would ask you to pray for his son, Trent, who is, who is 15 years old. Pray that God rescues him from that disease. And no matter what happens, that, that Trent would walk with the Lord. Um, the second funeral I did was for another David. 
Uh, that funeral was on Friday. Uh, on Saturday, I did a funeral for uh, David Coots. Uh, David Brown, that I just told you about, was 45. Uh, David Coots uh, was 39. Uh, David also joined our church uh, back in 2003. I wasn't yet the permanent pastor. I was the interim pastor. And one Sunday morning while preaching, I noticed that two or three rows over here filled up with a whole bunch of people sitting together. And you could tell, you know, they're related. Uh, one way you can tell in church whose family are is those the people who sit right next to each other. If there's a space in between, you know they're not related. Uh, that, just telling you what I see. Uh, but anyway, um, they came and they all sat together. And after the service, one by one, uh, one person said, can I visit with you this week? And I said, sure. And I got the name and contact information. And then another person with the, with the clan came and said, can I visit with you sometime this week? And I noticed it was the same last name. <laughs> and then another, and then another. And it turned out that uh, there were five siblings in their 20s and uh, who were definitely not walking with the Lord and, you know, living with various people and, uh, you know, they had uh, small children, these kids in their 20s. And one of the five, uh, David's twin, Danny, had died in a car accident. And grandma had been praying for them for years and sharing the gospel with them. And the one of the five siblings who knew Jesus as Savior was Danny, the one who died. And I watched three of those siblings come to the Lord. And mom and an uncle and, and a husband and a friend. And the way that God used uh, the Coots family is, is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, David shared the gospel with the guy who used to be his drug buddy. Uh, over and over and over again, his name was Ben Holland. Uh, ben uh, came to our church, accepted Christ. Uh, we baptized him here, uh, and God called him to ministry. And he's currently a youth minister near Dallas, and uh, he came in and was a part of the service yesterday, and I asked him yesterday, I said, Ben, I said, no, you can't give me an exact number, but how many people would you estimate you've led to the Lord? He said, I, I don't know. And I think, go ahead, j just give me something, because I want to I show people what an impact you know, God had through this family through Danny's death, you know, 10 years ago, and, he, and, and through David, who shared Christ with you. And he said, I don't know, he said, probably 50, maybe more like 100. And, and he said, those are just the ones that I walked all the way through, and, and they accepted Christ. He said, I've shared with lots more than that. And I was like, that is awesome, right? And so um, in the service yesterday, Ben, who I was just telling you about, shared his testimony, and he shared how David was relentless uh, in sharing the gospel with him, and how David had asked him, if you were to die tonight, do you know if you'd be in heaven or hell? And Ben shared that story, and, um, and I shared how when I did David and Courtney's wedding here, and I did two weddings, the first one was immediate, because they were living together, and they had kids together, and they didn't want to be living in sin anymore, so they came to me, and they're like, we got to get this right right now. But we also want to have a big wedding. And so, so what I did is I, married, I said, let's marry you right now. So we, we, they, I married them very quickly. And it was like, you know, on a weekday, there was like five people here. And the lights were off. And then we had the big wedding several months later. In the big wedding with their friends, uh, they had me tell the story of how they had gotten saved because of uh, David's twin, Danny's death, and how God had used that to bring them to the Lord, and how they wanted all their friends who were there for the wedding to come to know Jesus too. And so I shared that in the funeral yesterday. Uh, after, after the service, one of Danny's, sorry, one of David's nephews, he's 39, okay, and he leaves four kids behind, and his wife, and a close family. One of David's nephews came up to me right after the service, and I'm standing there, and the casket's right here, and everybody's crying, right? And I'm over on the side, and, and one of those nephews came up to me and said, uh, I want to get saved. How can I do that? And can I do it right now? And then after I finished talking to, uh, his name is Matthew, after I finished talking to him, uh, his sister walked up to me, and she said, I want to get saved. Can I do that right now? And so I said, right now, right now. So I prayed with the second person to receive Christ. And then another friend came up and said, I want to get saved. Can I do that right now? I, I spoke with six people. And three of them accepted Christ. And the other three really just needed a prayer of, of assurance of salvation. Six people we talked about that with at the end of that service. And so uh, as we were singing today and, we were, and Derek encouraged us to meditate 
I was thinking about how Job said, yet you slay me, I will still praise you. And so in the midst of pain, that's when we have reason to praise him, right? There's more I'm going to say that, but let me, let me show you to you out of the scriptures. So, so now let's put the slide up. And I'm going to come back to that. Because we will end with praising God. See, kings uh, throughout history, and I need my notes, pardon me. Kings throughout history have uh, done things uh, to let people know how great they are, right? So uh, the pharaohs built the pyramids. Uh, kings have had statues of themselves placed among the gods. Uh, in fact, uh, most kings in some way can claim some kind of divine heritage or divine right to do whatever it is they want to do. And so people are used to, there's certain things you have to do before you approach the king. And if you approach the king wrong, you're going to be killed. Even today, there's a whole set of, it's in the back of a dictionary, by the way. Did you know that? If you look in the back of a dictionary, there's etiquette about how you talk to royalty. Seriously, in the back, go, go check. If you have a dictionary, in the back of your dictionary, it'll tell you how to address different kinds of people. And there's a section where it tells you how to talk to a king or a queen. And there's certain things you're supposed to do and certain things you're not allowed to do. And that kind of thing continues today. And so, so kings are people who demand your loyalty and demand your praise and demand that you treat them as better than everybody else. And so Jesus shows up and he walks almost everywhere that he goes. Uh, if you remember, Jesus can do anything that he wants. I mean, there's a reason why when when Satan tempted him to turn the rocks into bread, why that's a sin. I mean, there's not a verse in the Bible that says don't turn rocks into bread, right? Have you ever wondered why would that be sinful? Jesus was demonstrating what kind of king he was because he could have used his power to make his life easy. Think about it. The disciples didn't have to walk anywhere. Jesus could have transported them instantly everywhere, and they didn't, ha they didn't have to sit by a fire eating whatever food they just happened to have. Jesus could have given them a banquet of kings every night, Right? But he didn't do that. He didn't use that power for himself. Jesus was not that kind of king. Jesus was a new kind of king, the kind of king that the world had never seen before. And I will add, and the world has never seen since. And so we approach, we get to Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And this is a famous story, but I'm hoping that you'll see it today in a way that you have never seen it before. Because here we have a king entering the city, but he is entering in a very different way way. So after, after Jesus had told a parable about the fact that he was going to go away and come back one day, and that was the point of the parable, he goes, he goes on up to Jerusalem. And wherever you were in Israel, you were going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was up on the top of a high place. As he, as he approaches Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, look at verse 30, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus and threw their cloaks in the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Now at this point, he has left Bethany. He has raised Lazarus from the dead, and there are multiple disciples. And disciples doesn't just mean the 12. A disciple is any follower of Jesus. So at this point, he's got a large crowd of disciples and followers who are following him. As, they go, as he goes along on this donkey, they, they spread the cloaks in front of them. Jesus is a new kind of king. He's a new kind of king because, because this king is actually in control. Notice what Jesus does. Jesus sends his disciples and says, I want you to go get a, a colt for me. And it's a donkey colt they go and they get. This is intentional. This is, this is deliberate. This is, this is Jesus planning and, and premeditation. Well, how do we know that? Well, in one case, in one sense, he already planned, he planned his entry. He'd already thought about it, right? He told them, go get this. So before he goes into town, he tells men to go do that. He is in complete control of what he's going to do. And Jesus has a plan. In fact, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we hear this scripture. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I think that Jesus was intentionally fulfilling prophecy, intentionally fulfilling messianic prophecy as the son of David, the one king who would come and rescue Israel. Now, did he plan ahead, right? Had he already sent someone ahead and, and arranged for the, for the cult to be ready for him? Or was he, did he just have supernatural knowledge here that, we, that, he, that he used and know that that cult would be there? We don't know which it was, but it doesn't really matter. Because either way, Jesus was in control. Now, there are other kings who have tried to control their own destiny. Kings who have tried to defeat death right, by having their armies or their wives buried with them, by having clay armies stored underground so they could fight with them one day when they come back. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that kings have tried to control their own destiny. There is, there is Xerxes. You know Xerxes, the king who is, who is king in the book of Esther? One time, in order to get his army over to Greece by land, he had to build a bridge or a strait of water. And he had his engineers start construction on the bridge. But before it was finished, a storm came and destroyed all the progress that he'd made. So everything they had done on the bridge, whoosh, washed away by the storm. Xerxes was so upset at what happened that he had every engineer beheaded. And then he sent his soldiers down to the water and actually had them whip the sea 300 times for its failure to obey him and comply with his plans. And you're thinking that's nuts, right? Not for a king. Because the way the kings thought was, they're in charge of everything. They're divine. And so the sea had not obeyed him. Yet we serve a king who stood up and sp spoke and said, peace, be still. And the wind and waves were still. And his disciples said to each other, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? Jesus was a different kind of of king. There are all kinds of kings who have done things to control their own destiny, who built great buildings that are now just ruins. There are kings today who try to control their own destiny. There are people, there are things that want to be our kings. Uh, the Bible term for it would be idols. But there are things that want to be they want to be our kings, whether it be uh, fame, might be our idol, or recreation or entertainment, whether it be things that the media gives us. There's all kinds of things that compete, that want to be in charge and have our praise and have our allegiance as our king, whether it be, whether it be a shopping site or whether it be our job or whatever it is, or all kinds of things that, that seem to demand on us a loyalty that you would give a king. And they act like they're actually in control of their own destinies, and they're not. Only Jesus is the king who is completely in control, and nothing happened to him without his permission. Jesus is a new kind of king because he is in control, and this king is also a new kind of king because he is humble. See, in verse 35, we're told that Jesus was riding on a donkey. Now, by this time, kings typically wore, wore, rode on horses. The last king that had ridden a donkey normally was David. And then later kings of Israel, they adopted the horse, right? Big and strong and fierce, bat, winning in battle. And Jesus comes in humility on a donkey. Other kings are, are prideful, casting themselves as divine. There was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the, the king who was king during the time of the Maccabees, during the festival of Hanukkah, celebrates what happened under King Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was, he was a Greek king, and he was ruling over the area of Israel, and he was forcing the Jewish people to abandon their religion, and he tried to force them to worship the Greek gods, to the point that he erected a statue of Zeus in the temple and sacrificed a pig to it. This king put on a coin 
his own face. And normally, up to that point, normally what was on coins were the gods. He put his own face on there with, with the inscription, King Antiochus, God made manifest, bearer of victory. He called himself Epiphanes, which means God in the flesh, or God's image, or God made manifest. But he's not the only one, right? So many kings have been prideful and painted themselves as a son of the gods. Even in the, even in the Middle Ages, the kings of Europe claimed the divine right, that they were appointed by God to rule, and this is why they would have the pope or someone like that crown them. And so everything they did was right because that's what God wanted. And so over and over and over again, kings have been prideful and claimed the kind of authority that only belongs to God. Herod the Great, that same king who murdered babies to stop the Messiah from taking his place. Herod's title was King of the Jews, and he was threatened by anybody else who might have that title. The same Herod, because the people did not like him. This same Herod, when he was on his deathbed, had many, many Jewish leaders rounded up and brought, and brought into Jerusalem. And, and he gave his soldiers an order, and he said, I want you on the day that I die, once you hear that I'm dead, I want you to kill these Jewish leaders. That way there will be mourning in Jerusalem when I die. Now, by the way, this is a good part of that story. His soldiers did not carry the order out. They were captured and they were held, but after he died, his soldiers released him, released the Jewish leaders. So that's a good, that's a good part. But here's my point. Kings are prideful. Kings want your attention. And modern day kings want your attention. And they want your praise. And modern day idols brag about themselves and everything they can do. But Jesus is humble. He is a new kind of king. Look with me in verse 36. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, and I will keep reading. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And so they're praising him, right? They're praising him for the things that he has done. And here's what they say. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now let's leave it there on verse 38 for a second because I want you to, I want you to see this song they're singing. Because this song is they are quoting from several different psalms from Psalms 113 through 118, which are called the Hallel Psalms. Hallel is a word which means praise in Hebrew. Hallelujah means you praise the Lord. It's a command. And so they're quoting from these psalms. Now, these psalms were sung at the end of Passover. It would have been kind of like their Christmas carols. And so they're familiar and they're used to them. And so they, they cry out and they sing, quoting the, psalm, the psalms, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But wait a minute, they change something. The, the Psalms say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But spontaneously, the, the crowd changes the lyric a little bit. And they change it to, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they add another line that's not in the Psalms. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, if you remember what the angels said, right? Peace in heaven and glory to God because he has come, the king that we have been waiting for in the name of the Lord. Now, as I, as I thought about this and I thought about how these people are, are spontaneously singing and praising God, right? And we're going to find out from Jesus this is a good thing. This is the right thing for them to do. I thought, I wonder if there's any comments here, right, about how we praise God and what kinds of songs we sing. And I thought, I wonder if you can make an argument that you should sing old familiar songs because they quote from the Psalms, right? Which is kind of like their hymn book, which they do, which is awesome. So they knew the songs good enough and they knew, I'll add, the scripture good enough that it just comes out spontaneously. 
but they also change it a little bit, right? So there's possibly an argument here for adapting the hymn to the context. And they also add a verse or a new song. The Bible says over and over to sing a new song. So what we have here is we have singing an old song, we have an adapted song, and we have a new song all together. And guess what they're doing? They're praising God. And so look at what happens. Look at the next verse. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why would they say that? Because from their perspective, this is blasphemy. You don't deserve that kind of praise. Only God deserves that kind of praise. And so Jesus, our humble king, says something remarkable here. Something which, if it's not true, is just as arrogant as the other kings you've heard about. Look at verse 40. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Matthew tells us that they were singing, they were also singing Hosanna, which means save us now. And they're crying out Hosanna, save us now. And they also cry out Hosanna in the highest. So turning the word save into a song of praise, not only save us now, but we are saved and you have saved us from the highest heaven. And so they are praising God for this and they're singing out. And Jesus basically says this, they have to, because somebody has to praise me as the king that God has promised. And if they're not going to do it, creation itself is going to do it. If it's not true, this is a bold, prideful statement. It's ridiculous even, as ridiculous as Xerxes trying to beat the river for destroying his bridge. If this isn't true, it's ridiculous for Jesus to say, I deserve the praise of rocks. But the Bible says that through him and for him, everything that was made was made by Jesus and for Jesus. Of course the rocks would cry out. Somebody has to praise him because he deserves it. And so how is Jesus a new kind of king? He's number one, actually in control. Number two, he is humble. And third, he is the first king. He is the only king to be worthy of the praise that is due to God. Other kings have wanted that, but only one has deserved it. And so... How do we apply this to our lives, right? There's the big question. What's the preacher going to say? What, what do we do as a result of that? Well, I love the way I express it to the kids. and I stole that from somebody else. I saw it somewhere and thought it was awesome. Don't let a rock do your job. You, as the, as the rescued ones, as the ones who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, the ones who have been saved by Jesus, the one and true King, we should be praising God. Do not let a rock do your job. And you can praise him in a gathered setting with other Christians, and you should. You can praise him by yourself in your car, and you should. You, should, you can praise him everywhere that you are, both out loud and silently and constantly. But you know what? When I say silently, I mean in your mind, but I don't mean you can keep quiet. Because at some point, you need to tell people, no. So here's my application. I could say, you should sing louder. You should praise God. Even if you don't know the song, learn it. Try and sing. And sing, sing, sing. Praise God. I could say that. Pray, tell other people what God has done for you. Not just praising him in song, but praising him in word and story and testimony. I could tell you to do that. Just like I could tell my son when he hits the other son, tell him you're sorry. I could do that. Because that's the right thing to do, right? The right thing for my son to do when he hits the other one is to apologize. So I could say to him, apologize. The problem is, he may not mean it. If I simply say, say you're sorry, I'll get, I'm sorry. He may be a great actor, I'm really, really sorry, but may not be. You see, my goal is, what needs to happen is not me telling him, say you're sorry, what needs to happen is the child needs to actually be sorry. 
And if his heart is actually sorry, he will say he's sorry, or he will apologize, or he will make up for that in some way. He will express that sorrow. I don't have to say, say you're sorry to somebody who actually is. And so I shouldn't have to say to you, you need to praise God. Because if you love him, if you are happy in him, if you rejoice for both the good and the bad, then you will praise him. In your heart, you will want to praise God because he deserves it. Think about who Christ is and what he has done and what he is still doing in your life. How can you not praise him? And that is what makes God glorious. The, have you ever thought the whole purpose of evangelism, the only whole purpose of telling other people about Jesus so they would get saved is so that God would be praised forever in heaven. The ultimate purpose is worship, which is awesome. Because not only is worship fun and enjoyable when you mean it, right? But it's what God deserves. And so when you share the gospel with somebody and they accept Christ and they're saved, there is somebody else who is now going to praise God for eternity. And God gets there and receives the worship that he receives for eternity. There's a sense in which we gather here as Christians, we praise God, we're just practicing for heaven. We're just, we're warming up because that's what we're gonna be doing. And it's awesome. And what, what glorifies God is when you praise him in the good and the bad. And when, when God does good things in your life, you praise him for that and you give him the credit. And when hard things are happening, you still praise him because that's what glorifies him. I'm gonna paraphrase something John Piper said once. What he said is, uh, prosperity gospel, that is the, the health, and wealth, health and wealth gospel, and 95% of the preachers on TV okay, are garbage because they're preaching this stuff. And they're saying things like, if you have enough faith, if you send me money, if you this, that, and whatever, you can unlock God's promises, and you can have a nice car and pay off all your bills and be healthy and all this blah, 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 blah. And, and, this, and this health and wealth gospel has origin in America and is being exported to the rest of the world. The version of Christianity that's going to Africa, a whole lot of it is health and wealth, prosperity, preaching. And, and here's where I'm paraphrasing Piper. He says, God is not glorified when someone comes up to you and says, did Jesus give you that BMW? Well, I'll take Jesus. Did Jesus give you all that money? Well, I'll take Jesus. Because what they really want is the BMW. It's idolatry. That doesn't make God great. It doesn't make God praised in the eyes of people and in their hearts. What, what makes God praise is when we suffer. When we lose everything and all that we have left is God and we say, God, you are good enough. And though you slay me, I will praise you because you are my salvation. And my heart might fail and my strength may fail, but you are enough and I praise you. That makes God glorious. And so I close with the scripture. This is from, this is Paul writing in the book of Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to praise you. You could have the rocks do it. 
In a sense, they do. All of creation praises you and points to you. But Lord, you let us speak out loud. And you let us speak with words. And you let us speak truth. And you let us speak from our experience. And so, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of praising you. Lord, help me in those days when I don't to find great joy in expressing praise to you. May it be as you continue to prepare me for heaven that the most fun I ever have is when, is when I'm praising you. And Lord, my prayer for, for this congregation and for these who are here who know Jesus is that they might point to you in all that happens, good and the bad. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who gave up heaven, gave up so many of his divine rights so that we might go and be with him forever, so that we might receive what we don't have a right to, that he became like us so that we could become like him as our older brother. Lord, thank you for salvation. And thank you that when we say, Hosanna, save us now, we know it is true. And you have done it. And so it is not lightly that we close this prayer in the name of Jesus, our King and our Savior. Amen. Please join us as we stand and sing together. This is your opportunity. This is my opportunity to respond to what God has been saying to you today through his word.